Welcome to week six. Uh, the good news is, is this is when the lectures start getting a little more terse. Uh, in other words, we're not going to go right to the end anymore. Well, most of the way anyways. Um, that's a bonus for you guys, in a way. Um, it also gets, this also where the stuff gets, depending on how your mind works, easier to work with or harder to work with, depending which way your brain's wired. <coughs> Uh, if you're good with the pra with practical kind of stuff, this is going to go really well for you. If you have a really hard time with practical stuff, it might be a little rougher. Um, now, this week I'm continuing with SQL. Specifically, I'm going to start focusing on how to use the select statement. And the select statement is actually the most complex command, I guess you could say, in the SQL language. Um, it's complex enough that I'm going to spend two or three lectures on it. And why does it deserve that much attention? Because 95 to 98% of what you do with a database involves select statements. You know, you might insert data once in a while, or but you will retrieve the data all the time. Um, some industries it's actually a little different, depending on how the data is handled. If you look at the libraries, the data goes in once, for most of the data and then it gets pulled out all the time. In the banking industry, the data is being touched all the time in every single direction, uh, mostly because their database systems suck in general. Um, but that's, you know, the basics of what we're going to be taking on today, starting with the select statement. Uh, before I continue, though, I put the a small announcement up on the board. Assignment 1 is due by midnight. If you want if you want the ability to have full marks, doesn't mean you will get full marks, but at least you will have the ability to get full marks. However, you have a technically until next Tuesday, end of day. If you're not happy with what you've done and you think you can do better, and you're willing to take a 10% penalty, which means even if you did perfect, the best you'd get is a 90. Um, you know, you have that option. Or if you decide you haven't been bothered to start yet, because, you know, last minute is great. Nothing like that last minute panic to fuel your creative juices. By the way, that doesn't work. Uh, usually it ends in failure and crying. Usually wrapped around a bottle of wine or beer. Um, you know. So, that's the one announcement for today. Without further ado, oh, the other announcement, I put up the files for Lab 6 and 7. Those people saying, well, I want to do lab six and I can't, the file's not there. I've put them up now because I didn't want you working on it while you should have been working on your assignments. It's all part of the plan. Okay. Like I said, today we're going to focus on the select statement. And the way the class is going to go is I'm going to talk for 12 slides worth and then I'm going to do a demonstration. Now the select statement is used to retrieve records from a database. It's very, very flexible. Um, and it's made up of two, three, four, well, five, six, seven different parts. Depending on what you need to do, you keep tacking on pieces. At the very smallest level, there's two parts to it. 90% of the time, 80% uh, of the time, you're dealing with three, maybe four pieces. Uh, and then it gets creative past that. Um, today I'm going to focus on the first three pieces of the select statement. The, the basic three parts of the select statement is the field list, the table list, and the conditionals list. So, what does that mean? Well, when we're talking about the field list, we're defining which pieces of information we want to retrieve out of the database. And I talk about performance a bit later um, because of this. However, you have two options. Uh, the first option is the asterisk, star. <coughs> In this case, it doesn't mean go read the fine print. It means give me everything, absolutely everything out of the database, out of the table that you're, you're, t you're accessing. That means if the table's got three columns, great, you get three columns back. If the table's got 50 columns, you're getting 50 columns back. 
Or you can retrieve a list, a defined field list. In other words, I want to retrieve the ID, the name, and the email address. You can define those three fields to be retrieved. So let's say you're dealing with a fairly complex record, a table that has, say, 50 columns, but you only ever need the person's name and email address because you want to spam them. Well, you can actually retrieve just those two pieces. And often I get asked, well, what's the advantage of one over the other? All right, let's, let's explain the difference. On a two-column, three-column table, there is no advantage. I'll be honest. You're retrieving three values times however many num number of rows. So on a two- or three-column table, each row might be a K. And you're retrieving 1,000 rows. So 1K times 1,024 rows is one megabyte. Cool. Let's just say we're retrieving 50 columns instead. And suddenly, instead of being 1K, there's a couple of big text fields in there. There's some dates. There's all kinds of stuff. Suddenly, instead of being 1K, each row is 25K or 100K. So instead of retrieving one megabyte, you're going to retrieve, right? Instead of one, it's 100. Therefore, instead of retrieving one megabyte, you're going to retrieve 100 megabytes out of the server. Now, I know today's computers are fast, but your computer still notices the difference between one megabyte and 100 megabytes, especially when it's shoving that stuff in memory. However, often on web servers, the database server doesn't reside in the same place as the web server or the client application sits on your machine and is talking to some back end somewhere. People that have to deal with dumb terminals and or modern client applications, <coughs> banks, um, experience it when you try to retrieve a customer record that has a lot of history on it. It goes, oh, I'm sorry, that took a second. Now, copying one megabyte across the network as opposed to copying 100 megabytes across the network. That's where you want to start refining how much you're retrieving. Because even if you're retrieving just out of the database, whether you're retrieving three columns or 50 columns, it's just the sheer volume of data. If it's 50 columns and all it is and there's a series of Booleans, that'll be like that because, you know, they're, all of there is is a, is a bit each, right? A bit plus a definer. If you're dealing with email address, address, phone numbers, notes, descriptions, comments, this customer is a complete jackass. He wanted free coffee for the third time today. That kind of stuff. You know, when you start having a little novel in the notes, abusive customer. Um, anybody who's ever worked in customer service knows about those little magic fields hidden in the customer table. The customers don't know about it, but when you leave, they're typing like mad about how horrible you were as a person. <laughs> you laugh. I used to work in a call center. So yeah, there is actually a public notes and then a private notes. Public notes you can send to the customer. The private notes is the customer is a complete averaging asshole. <laughs> yes. You didn't work for IT, did you? No. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's just say a Compaq or HP or digital. The notes in the private field were very explicit as to what kind of person it was. But you know, when the notes get big, that means that if you've written 100 words, odds are that's about, what, 100K? Once you put in all the delimiters and everything goes with it. So you're gonna retrieve 100K and you're running a big frickin' report and you're gonna retrieve, say, 10,000 rows. 10,000 rows, big record. <clears throat> Application goes hiccup. In actual fact, I've got a database that, I, that you guys are gonna be using around lab eight or nine. I've got it loaded on my machine now, so when I'm doing the demo later, you'll see the speed difference of retrieving one or two columns as opposed to retrieving all the columns. Um, all right, so I'm actually going to write out the statements as we go here. So the select statement is select. You have the choice of star or actually defining the fields. So if we go... And by the way, there are some database profs, not me, 
who will give will give Mark this wrong. Because as a rule of thumb, you should never pull everything. But you know what? There is a really good use for pull everything. If you don't have a database diagram and you don't know what the table looks like, how else are you going to know what it looks like inside? Give me everything. But in my case, and I do recommend use a limited field list. OK. The next part, and actually I'm going to write down numbers next to this. Part number one, part number two. There's three kinds of table lists. The first one is a single table, which is what I'm going to focus on today. I'm going to show you guys how to retrieve data out of a single table. It's the simplest command. It's a good place to start. Next week, or two weeks from now, depending how this goes, uh, I'm probably going to make people cry. And usually it's the guys. Just saying. Um, I'm going to teach you guys about joins. That's how you retrieve data from more than one table at the same time. And this is, you know when I'm getting you guys to define your foreign keys and your primary keys? That's where joins come in. That's what those are for. And then there's derived tables, which will definitely be covered two lectures from now. Uh, derived tables is painful to understand. Um, it's you're making up a table on the fly. Sort of, but not quite. That's why it's derived. It's like a derived attribute, but you're deriving an entire chunk of data. Um, and the syntax is from whatever the table is called. So for a single table, I'm building up a statement as I go. This is going to say, give me the ID and the name from countries. As you realize, it's very English. Um, usually with SQL, if you can read it as an English statement and it makes sense, it will usually work. Will it do what you want it to do? Not necessarily. It's going to do exactly what you told it to do. But it will work. If you can read it and it makes sense almost as a sense or as a little story, it'll probably work. All right. And then the third, number three. Number three are the conditionals. Conditionals are rough. Uh, did you guys learn about if statements yet? Please say yes. Even if you're lying, please say yes. <laughs> All right, good. So you guys know about the if statement in Java. And you guys have learned about what happens if you put more than one, if, one condition inside your if statements? OK, good. Whew. Last time I did this lecture, I taught it the day before they learned about the if statement. It was rough. This is going to go better. OK, it's known as the where clause. Now, the WHERE clause is a series of Boolean expressions. If you guys don't know what a Boolean expression is, it's a piece of it's an expression that, it, it, that resolves either the true or false. Yes or no. That is just like an if statement in Java. And if, I, if, if statements in Java are anything like if statements in every other language, because I've never programmed a day in my life in Java, there's no such thing as maybe unless you write a really complicated if statement. Then it just falls over because it's too complicated and that's why it becomes maybe. Um, there's several operators you can use. You can have multiple clauses and then there's the brackets. Those are the bits and pieces. Now, the standard compares and operators exist. These ones you guys should look, for, should look familiar to you guys. Less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, bang equal sign, also known as not equal to. Um, the equality check is a single equal sign. Java people always have a hard time with this because you guys are used to going equal, equal. 
No. In Java, it's a single equal. Yeah, in other words, it's job equals Scotia Bank. True or false? For one of you in here, it's true. Ish. Right? So that is what I mean. It's an equality check. Or, you know, weather is crappy. Weather is equal to crappy. Right now, who the heck knows? It's kind of fuzzy at the moment, up in the air. Um, but that is a single equal sign. This is one that throws a lot of Java people and C-like language people for a loop. Because if you threw in a double equal sign, it's going to go no. It's just how it is. Okay. Not equal, which is this one here, can be written two ways. It used to be this. Because it's impossible for something to be either smaller and greater at the same time. Which is the, this still works. It's the standard that was in SQL till ah, about eight years ago. Then somebody said, you know what, we really should be like everybody else. And say not equals. Um, Postgres got this about one major version ago. So up till version seven, it didn't support this language construct. Uh, MySQL's had it for years. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server now supports it also. I think uh, 2006 or 2007 is when it got it. It's a fairly new thing. You'll often see me use this syntax because that's what I grew up with. Don't panic. 20 years of this is hard to get past to change to this because considering it's the same number of keystrokes. Either of these will work. Those both mean not equal to. Okay, there's a few other special comparison operators. There's in. This is something you guys don't have in Java. It's in a list. I know, a Perl guy just went whoop, because Perl's got it. <laughs> Java doesn't. Or well, actually, Java kind of does. You can do an, an array splice and compare, but you know. Um, you can give it a list. And literally, it's a comma delimited list. In that list, if you want to compare strings, you can use strings, you can do dates, you can do numbers. As long as all the elements are the same, of the same type. In other words, don't mix match numbers and letters. I mean, don't mix match alphanumerics with just pure numerics or alphanumerics and dates because funny things are going to happen to your data. As in, it's probably not going to work. Um, there's also between. <laughs> you can say between one and four. Now, when you do a between, it's the equivalent of saying that greater than one, less than four. Between is uh, actually it's inclusive, so. Sorry. It used to be exclusive till the last update of SQL. They changed their mind. It broke all kinds of code. So between is the same thing as writing a statement that is greater or equal to one and less than or equal to four. Between is much easier to read. Because if you say it's between one and four, the code itself makes it clear is <clears throat> is allows you to can check if something is null or if it's true or false because apparently something cannot be equal to true either it's true or it's not later why bother come for 24 minutes <laughs> I don't understand. If anybody feels feels the need to go, now's the time. So is allows you to check for nulls or booleans. Either it's null or it's not, 
Either it's true or it's not. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. Um, then there's not. Basically, not negates whatever else you're trying to do. So those little examples are in the slideshow is on Blackboard. I did make a point to upload it. And it is actually the same version I'm using today. Yes? Well, one comma two comma three comma four. There is another way of doing it depending on how you're retrieving your data. That's for later. Keeping it simple today. Uh, I don't want to cause too much pain. Um, like I said, the start of the lecture is an info dump and then it's a demo. The demo will make more sense. Um, now, what we do have to be careful about though is is true. Database servers that has true that have true booleans, this will work. That means pretty much every database server except for MySQL. MySQL does not have true booleans, so you cannot use is true. <clears throat> the only the way you implement a boolean in MySQL is using a tiny integer of one place, which means it has the same amount of yes/no values as my wife, anywhere between zero and nine possible yeses and nos. Just Okay, even with women in here can appreciate that one. <laughs> because guys do it too all the time. Do you feel like doing that today? Mm, I don't think so. Actually, that means no, by the way. <laughs> but just saying, there is, with MySQL, there's no true yes, no. There's shades of gray between zero and nine. As a rule of thumb, people use zero and one as false or true, and they ignore the rest. Anything greater than one is equal to true. And if it's zero, then it's false. Um, so if you end up working with MySQL, just be aware that you might get bit in the butt by your booleans because they don't actually exist. And what's even better is the design tools for MySQL let you define a boolean. This feels a boolean. What does it turn it into? Tiny int zero. There's actually tiny int one. It puts brackets in a one and it says it's a one bit integer. So zero to nine. One byte integer, zero to nine. It's fantastic. Uh, and there is no exclusive between. If you go not between, it'll give you everything less than one and everything greater than four. It'll exclude the range if you're not between. So this one here, if you do ID not between one and four, it'll give you zero and five and up. How do you do um, between one and four exclusive? Then you do greater than one and less than four. You have to do a two-part clause. That's just life. So, so this will retrieve the ID and the name from a country, from the country's table where the ID is equal to one. It'll pull the first country out of the list, which is going to be Canada because it's number one. Sorry, but you know, it's the truth. Yes. You can do math here, theoretically. You can do lots of math up there. Um, yes, there's math you can do. I do that later. But you can. You can actually use SQL as a calculator. And actually, with, um, with Postgres, you can actually do like finite math and calculus because it's able to do it. It can do geometry transforms for you, too. So yes, it can do the math. Um, well, how far does my math skills go on this? I showed how to calculate tax. <laughs> Just, you know. Um, if I were to put in something else, like... Where name's equal to Canada. That will match the word Canada explicitly. If the C is uppercase and you're working with a database that is case sensitive, which means uh, Postgres, half the version of Microsoft SQL Server, uh, not Oracle because it lies. Uh, MySQL, depending if somebody turned on a switch in the, their settings file, uh, DB2 is case sensitive. You know, so 
I'm just highlighting the fact that this is probably you should treat it as case sensitive regardless because you don't know for a fact it's going to be or not. I always assume your strings are case sensitive. You'll also notice my strings are wrapped in quote marks. Single quotes. Why single quotes instead of double quotes? Because single quotes are the accepted standard. Other database servers such as Oracle and MySQL allow you to use double quotes. Um, IBM DB2 will if you've turned on the configuration parameter. Microsoft SQL Server may or may not, depending if they've turned on explicit strings. Yes. No, I'm looking for anywhere where in the countries table where the name is exactly equal to Canada. No, this is an explicit match. When you use the equals fine, it has to be the absolute complete value within those quote marks. Even if it was lowercase Canada, that would not match. If it was half uppercase, lowercase, it won't match. If it was Canada is nice, it would not match. The equal sign is an explicit match. It must be exact. Which leads me to the next slide. I swear to God, I fed him that line. Every once in a while, you need to match. And you don't know exactly what it is you're looking for. And this is where it gets a little rough for new programmers. It's pattern matching. And Postgres supports pattern matching three different ways. There's the industry standard like operator. Now, the like operator allows you to match a pattern. With some database servers, such as MySQL, the like automatically implies case insensitive. And it sucks to be you if you're trying to find an exact match. Because then if you're trying to find strings that are exactly mixed case a certain way, it doesn't care. On the other hand, Postgres assumes you're going to be careful. Thus, it's case sensitive. But they were, the guys were really, really nice to you. So they decided to create a command called I like, which means it's like the dumb brother version of like. It's the insensitive one. Insensitive I like. So realistically, if you don't know exactly the case of what you're looking for, uppercase, lowercase, then use I like. And you'll often use this on people's names. And I don't think I've got a single Mac in this class, do I? I think it's the first group I've ever had that doesn't have at least one Mac in it. You know, like MacIsaac, MacArthur, Mac no, yeah, MacGyver, sure. Um, but like the last name Mac, so it's Scottish and Irish, right? MC is Irish, MAC is Scottish. And the way it works is sometimes, depending on how they wrote the name, the the middle letters get screwed up because somebody screwed up the data entry. I like lets you get around those problems because it's insensitive. It doesn't care if it's uppercase, lowercase. It has two wildcard characters because the like statement is the simplest match. It has the percent sign. Percent sign matches any any number of times. Now that sounds kind of funny, but I'll describe the pattern a little better mm, over here. Because if you haven't gotten this an announcement yet, you're doomed. Okay. Now, I'm going to look at the percent sign, for starters. If I, if let's say I'm trying to match There's a name, McIsaac. And there just so happens to be 
At some point, somebody hopped the boat and went to Ireland and forgot the A. I've seen it spelt both ways, okay? Now, let's say you're trying to find it in the database, and how many of you have ever had the experience of you're dealing with customer service and they can't find your name in the database because the person can't type or spell a people's name if they're life dependent on it? Two, at least. We've all had it. You should try Gudra one of these days, how well that goes over. Now, if I want to match this pattern, and so let's say I don't know for a fact the spelling for McIsaac, and if you've dealt in the call center after a while, you've discovered this little shortcut. And most customer retrieval systems will have this. I can go M percent sign C. So that will match anything that starts with the A, M, and ends in I C I S A A C. Now, it's good and bad because let's say the person's name was actually Mary McIsaac. That's all covered by the percent sign. The percent sign is really um, often what you'll end up with though is people will do instead just percent sign that's supposed to be a C percent sign Isaac that means anything that ends in Isaac period if there's no wild card at the end that means this is whatever's at the end of the string if there's a percent sign right at the beginning it says match anything until you hit this mat this combination of, of letters and or numbers it's really powerful Surprisingly so, you don't need regex to, to achieve some of the stuff. It, as far as quick data retrievals, it, it is very powerful, much faster than a regex and a database server that is. But there's still limits also. But let's say you know specifically you want to match M something C, you use the underscore instead. That means it'll match anything once. And there has to be something there. So if I go underscore C, that will not match McIsaac MC because there's nothing between the M and the C. So that's the pattern matching tools. And I've got a few examples up on the screen. If I go ABC like ABC, well, that's going to be true because it's an exact match. That's all there is to it. You know, ABC is like ABC because they're the same. If I do ABC like A percent sign, that's true because the string starts with A. If I go ABC like percent sign A percent sign, that's also true because the letter A is somewhere in there at least once. If it's in there more than once, who cares? If I go ABC like blank B blank, that's also going to be true because it's going to match one. It says anything be anything. And then if I say ABC like C, that's going to be false because ABC is not like C. It's not the same. At this point, you're almost doing an exact comparison operator. These tools are usually, I'd say 95% of the time, enough to pattern match inside of a database. Um, you can mix match your percent signs to your heart's content. Um, you can mix match percent signs and underscores. Let's say you're trying to find anybody in the Ottawa area. And you know the postal code starts with K2. Well, you can search with everything that starts with K2, and they'll give me everybody in Ottawa, the Ottawa Valley. Well, or the Ottawa area. Yeah, that's the VAR card. Well, no. The VAR card is the length of data. This is the data itself. Um, same thing with a phone number. Let's just say you're trying to find all the 555 numbers. You're, you're digging through your database and you're trying to find everybody who typed in 555 as an, as an exchange. Because lots of people put in 555. Because 555 has special meaning. A lot of people don't realize that. If 
By the way, that's how you do a, the the good old uh, 411. For those of you that remember 411, that's what replaced it. It's 5551212. Five, one, two, one, two. So if you can't find somebody's number and you're trying to call out east, you can dial 902-555-1212. Five, 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 one, two, one, two. And that will connect you to directory services for the Maritimes. If you do 705, it'll do all of Northern Ontario. 419, it'll do Toronto. Is that Montreal? 419 is Toronto. 416? 419 is Montreal. 914, eh, whatever. Whatever. They keep adding exchange, yes. One character, and there must be a character there. Yes, one character, and there has to be one there. The percent sign says match anything, even if it's nothing, until you find the matching string. So if you have M percent sign C, it'll give you anything that starts with M, ends in C, regardless. There's nothing. It's and because ABC is not like C. And in theory, if I wrote the same one, if I did that, that would also be false because the string does not begin with C. It reads your pattern from left to right. And it's explicit. Yes? Then it'll match, which, which way? If I do this? Yes, that'll work because C's in there somewhere. If I did this, it would also be true because it ends in C. Once you've played with it and that lab six gets you to play with some of this stuff, yes? There's more. <laughs> There's similar too. It's like like, but more complicated. Um, I show it to you on the slides. I never expect you guys to use it. Uh, that's why I provide a link. Yes. I've used it once in the last 15 years. Uh, because I used regex and stuff. <laughs> regular expressions, which I do not have a slide for in this. Because I don't think you guys learn regular expressions until level two. And it, it's enough to make people cry. Um, so similar to provides a significantly more robust pattern match. Um, for example, like I said, I provided a link and it looks great on that screen, but it looks terrible on that screen. But if you download the slideshow, you'll be able to pull it up. You can go with similar to. And again, it's just like like. ABC similar to ABC? Of course it is. Is ABC similar to A? Well, that's false. Now, here's where it gets weird. You can use brackets and a pipe symbol. That's the vertical bar on your keyboard. That's the one that, if you've got a standard keyboard, it's above the enter key. If you've got a non-standard keyboard or a Mac keyboard, no, it's not there. Um, it's the character above the back of the backslash. Um, so it's basically, it's called pipe or bar, depending on who's, who you're talking about. If this allows you to, you can say, is ABC similar to B or D? Does it contain B or D? That's what it's doing. Yes. Um, but on the other hand, if I go, is similar to, and this is basically saying, does it begin with C, B or C? That's false because it doesn't start with B or C. So that's what this slide does. It's complicated. I don't expect to learn how to use some similar to, but I have, for full disclosure, say it's there because it's part of the SQL standard. Uh, the reason why there's not a slide for the regex is because it's the standard. But it is part of the standard, but nobody implemented it the same way. So there's no point in me showing it to you guys if no two people do it the same. Um, There's also, you can actually return the match. So it's here, it'll actually match. And if you put in a certain delimiter, 
So if you use pound sign something pound sign, it'll actually return that to the query. So just like for people that have worked with regular expressions, you know you can extract parts of the regular expression to return it to the function calling it. This allows you to do the same thing. It's really power. This is actually surprisingly powerful. Um, but like I said, if you want to know more about this, click on the link because I'm going to stop right here. Um, but I will put in one note for those that have worked with regular expressions in the past. It supports the full POSIX set, including uh, repositioning of arguments. So I can match, extract, and reposition and rewrite. So any, if, you're, if, you're, if you've worked with Perl or any language that supports full regular expressions, you'll feel happy. Then it's using, that's the operator for, for the regular expression, hey? Sort of like this, which is basically what regular expressions are for. Okay, now is the last bit before I get things a little more complicated. Well, not more complicated, close to the demo. Of course, sometimes one single conditional is not enough to do the job because it really isn't. For example, I need to run a report. Well, I don't run it. I've set it up. But we have a report that says, give me all our customers. This is literally real data I'm going to talk about. Give me all our customers that have CyanLab that are in Northeast American states that have not opted out of email. Then we spam them. Sorry, it's called marketing advertisements. <clears throat> it's called spam. I'm so glad I don't have to do that job anymore. It made me feel dirty every time I hit the button on 34,000 email addresses. Um, but sometimes you need to aggregate multiple conditionals just to keep filtering down, right? Um, anybody here ever have to deal with a lot of data, whether on paper or not? Or you're trying to, anybody here actually work towards a thesis or done some sort of uh, research project where you had tons and tons of sources and then as you were working through, you're slowly thinning it down based on certain criteria. Well, it's the same thing, but, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. So in SQL, we have two keywords, and and or. You can use them both. Um, it ends up being pretty English. You can use brackets to put together. This is just like... Except God, I can't draw an ampersand. Ampersand, ampersand is and in Java, not in SQL. If the magic keyword is and now here's what's really stupid mysql allows this why i don't know now or is double pipe you guys should know what the pipe operator is if you've been doing the if statement in java pipe pipe is equal to or this does not work in postgres because this is the concatenation operator so for those of you that have learned, have you learned about concatenation yet? Take one string, stick another string to it. You know, string A plus string B. I think, is that what it's, how it's done in Java? You add the two strings together? I don't know. I think it's, I know that's how it's done in C sharp, so I'm assuming it's probably the same in Java. Take string A plus string B. Um, if you try to do string A plus string B in SQL, it'll actually try to add them. So don't do that. Um, this is the concatenation. Basically, it's the equivalent of gluing two strings together. Therefore, don't try to do this. It's going to say, what the heck's wrong with you? Use the word or, because SQL is li English-like. Therefore, it's going to treat it as being English. Now, if I go looking at this right now, <coughs> ID is greater than four, and name is case insensitive like Dan. It'll say, basically, give me anybody whose name starts with Dan that has an ID greater than four. This is actually a query I use on a regular basis because I'm the one that writes the database system, so my ID is usually like one or two. 
Now I want to pull all the Dan's out of the database that's not me. So ID greater than two or greater than four. It's usually a safe bet. Um, if I turn this one like this, it'll go ID greater than four and name I like Dan. Therefore, if you read that one, it'll say, give me everybody whose name starts with Dan greater than four, ID is greater than four, or give me the person whose ID is two. So it'll match both. That means it'll give me at least two no matter what, and then everybody else passed it, passed four whose name is like Dan. All right. Just a few exercises before we go into demo mode. If we try to retrieve a record and the ID is equal to four, what's that going to give me back? The record with the ID of four. That's it. One record. If I say, give me a record of the ID greater than four and ID less than five. Think about this. What's it going to give you? Absolutely nothing. It's impossible for an ID to be greater than four and less than five at the same time if you're using integers. If you're using floats, it's entirely possible. Or using numerics. But do you use numerics and floats as your primary keys? Usually not. On the other hand, if I do ID greater than four or ID less than five, what is that going to give me? Absolutely everything. Yes. Why? Because theoretically everything is, there's stuff greater than four and there's stuff less than five. So you're basically saying, give me everything. If I say name like percent sign DA percent sign, what's that going to give you? Doesn't start with what? Did, I heard somebody else say something. Anything that has DA inside of it. So DA is inside of it. Good. ID greater or equal to five and name like ran or name like ran. What's that going to give you? It's a little more complicated now. Hey? Mm, close. Yes. Otherwise, give me all the ones that begin and ran. Well, no, it goes left to right. Just like in math, right? Unless you've got brackets, it goes in math. It goes left to well. There's also the multiplication and addition. But I mean, imagine they're all additions, because technically you're you're adding and subtracting values from your query, right? So it goes from left to right. Yes. It'll do this. Find that patch, and then find this. It's gonna do, it's gonna resolve the first two. And then add on the third. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Which is why normally you want to write it like this. Because now you can read it and it makes sense. This one and this one do the exact same thing. This one's easier to understand. At least if you've got you know basic grade 9 math skills. Because this is standard math, right? Resolve the brackets first, and then pass the results of that to the outside of the bracket, which tells me, give me everybody that's like this, or anybody who's like this. Now, if I say, I moved my brackets around, what's the difference between this one and this one? Uh, sure. That was vague. Well done. You answered the question by not answering the question, but yeah. Anything that's greater than or equal to five and whose names either start with ran or end with ran. So it'll give me a list of everybody. So essentially what happens is it's going to resolve these brackets first. So it'll find anybody who's got le less than, who either begins or ends with ran, and then it'll filter it down a second time by passing those results to the outside of the bracket to and give me any of these who ID is greater or equal to five. That means that any ands or any any rands or ends in 
or begins in rands, that of one between one and four will not be included in the result. <laughs> That's about as complicated as the where clause gets at this point in time. If you're able to work through basic if statements in Java, this is the same. Now, as I said, this comes with practice. And since SQL is very English-like, because you can actually read this pretty close to being a, an, English, an English sentence, a really bad run-on sentence, but it still reads like an English sentence, it'll do exactly what you told it to do, not necessarily what you asked it to do. Now, I got two questions, and I don't know which one was first. Ladies first. It'll do it left to right. It resolves the brackets first. It always resolves what's in the brackets first. And there are some advantages doing it that way because this will actually run a smidgen faster than this one. Uh, because by the time it's running the, the AND operator, it's already working on a lower set, a smaller set. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now we're going to do a demo after I drink a little bit because I'm really thirsty. I want to forget my markers. Okay, like I said, I'm going to be using a database that is, uh, you guys are going to end up using on, in one of your later labs. It's a database called ThinkCube. And this used to be my working database I used to use with the students, as in I gave you guys this one database and all the work was based on it. So this database has been around for years. It is actually quite large, even though there's only 11 tables, uh, because one of the tables, although you can't see it here for some unknown reason, um, because the information pane's missing, has 100,000 rows in it. So what's going to happen is I'm going to show you guys a few of the different peculiarities. And I'll show you guys again the most basic SQL statement, which you guys saw last week, which is select star. And you can see it took one second to return the results. So you can see the number down around here somewhere. And there's 10,000 customers in this database. Now, there's a reason why this database is so big, because I had students complain about how small the databases were, and it felt like they were playing with toys. So I created a database where, you know, some people had slow laptops that complained, and queries would run up to five minutes. Now you're accomplishing something. You're not learning anything extra. It's just going faster. It's going to take, now it feels like you're doing something. So. If I run this again, you'll see it's about a second every single time. Now, what you got to think about this. This is running on my local machine. It's retrieving 10,000 rows of data, but it's not even leaving my computer. And it's taking one second. Now, imagine this is on a website like, I don't know, Facebook or Amazon. You know how much those little one seconds add up? One second, there's 60 people pulling up that one page. Suddenly, you're up to a minute of lag. Right, 60 seconds, 60 people, right? Now, let me do the same thing. But this time, I just want to pull up the ID and the email. 312 milliseconds. So remember I was talking about the performance difference between using the asterisks and actually explicitly naming your columns? Now, it's 30 bits. Uh, what, what, what percentage would this be? Three times faster, technically, because I'm retrieving less information. Less text is being pulled. Now, if I were to do the same thing with <sighs> 
So 5.4 seconds. And that's actually a very simple query because there's no, there's no, nothing's on it, right? Now, let's say I wanted to just retrieve Same number of rows, only two columns of data, so that's 5.4 seconds, 1.7 seconds. And if you remember what this table looked like, it's almost all numbers, and numbers transmit fast. So that's a demonstration of why you don't want to use the asterisks unless you have to. The only time you use the asterisks is if you're trying to figure out what's inside the table and what does the data look like. After that, you shouldn't do that. Big performance hits. All right, so I'm going to go back to customers. And I've got my customers. So now let's say I want to go and search for um, I want the first 100, uh, the first 100 customers, or at least what I think is the first 100 customers. ID is left down or equal to 100. And I'm still going to retrieve everything. Bloop, 12 milliseconds. Why? Because I'm not asking it to give me tons of data. I'm asking for a tiny little bit. You'll also notice that there's 99 rows returned, not 100. Why? No. I don't have a 1 in the table. I actually had a test on that where I said, how many customers have an ID of less than uh, less than or equal to 100, and people actually type in 100 because they thought they had the, they knew the answer, and they got it wrong because they didn't write the statement to find out. There's 99. Yes, that gives you a preview of what kind of tricky things I do on SQL tests. Uh, don't assume you know the answer because you don't. Okay, so that's that one right there. The ID one is fairly straightforward. I could also do where ID between 100 and 500. Uh, 500. Boink. Okay, so 46 seconds, and I retrieved 401 route rows. Because I'm only running one command at a time. If I was running more than one command at a time, then it would bark. So if I tried to do this, it would say, what are you trying to do? Yeah, you need a semicolon. So between 100 and 500 gives me 501 row, 401 rows. Why? Because it includes 100 and 500. A lot of people think automatically, well, the answer is really 400, but it's not. Because 400 to, we well, mean 100 to 499 is, is 400, right? So people forget about zero. All right, so that's your between. So I'll just show the not, I'll just negate, say not between. Nine thousand six hundred ninety nine rows. Why? Because there's 10,100 and change rows in there. That's what not does. It negates whatever operator you want. So now I'm going to go back to between. Actually, I'm going to save this for future reference. And I'm going to start looking for people's names. Now, I'm looking for somebody. Whoops, I guess it helps if you actually tell what field you're trying to match. I'm looking for a Roman, which, of course, isn't going to match. Because there's nobody, there's not, there's not anybody with just that name in the database. I, I'm going to bring this back so you can see right here. But because I said, give me where the name is equal to Roman, but it's not equal to because it's not a complete match. People get confused on that. Because, and this is actually something that programmers have a really hard time explaining to non-programmers, that lowercase a is not equal to lower, uppercase a, and lowercase a is not the same thing as lowercase a, b, c. Why? Because it's not the same thing. 
It's explicit. Now, if I wanted to find everybody who starts with that, I could write it like such. And now it gives me everybody in here who starts with Roman. Now let's say I want to make it gender non-specific. Actually, I don't think I've got any Romans in there. Oh, well, poor Roman. Hey? I, I used a random data generator. 10,000 rows. It only has so many names in the pile. Um, so I'm going to go back to, I, I'm going to actually go back to, say I don't know for a fact, you know, where that appears, that doesn't match because it's case sensitive. Once again, if I make it I like, It'll match them again because it's a case insensitive. Once again, lowercase a is not the same thing as uppercase a. And if you're dealing with MySQL or Oracle, this is actually a very hard query to write. Because MySQL is not case sensitive unless you tell it to be. And it's painful and Oracle lies. Um, now let's say I want to match where it has the word Roman, Roman anywhere inside of it. And actually, I think it's still the same number of people. So let's say I want to find only because anybody who's got lowercase ro in it. There we go. 1,300 rows and change. Cool. But now let's say I just want the set that's in the middle earlier where I had my ID. So now it's going to say, give me anybody who's got ro in their name between IDs 100 and 500. And we go boop. We're back with 54 rows. It works well. And it's kind of cool because this one matched twice. Roman Roussel. <coughs> and uh, this one has Rue and Rousseau and uh, Rosalie. Because they're looking for RO anywhere. And it's only in the first, well, ID's 100 to 500. So that's how you do an AND. I could throw that around and go an OR. And that'll give me 1,700 rows. So give me all the ROs except for the ones between 100 and 500. All right. Now, here's the not. So we're going to decide we don't want Roman at all. I don't think he's here today, so I'm making fun of him. He's not even here. So it'll give me anybody who doesn't have the word the, name, the word Roman in their name. I could turn that around to anybody who doesn't have R-O-M, which is 9,046 rows. And I can take off the M. Now we're down to 8,700 rows. And because we don't like the letter R, we'll say we don't want anybody whose name has letter R in it. So 2,700 names in the database don't have the letter R in it. It's a totally pointless query, but it still demonstrates how this works. <coughs> now, oh, that's right, this one doesn't have a phone number on it. Now I gotta show you something about dates. So there's a field called created on. Created on is a timestamp. Means it's got a date and a time. What do you think that's going to match? Anybody feeling brave and want to speak up? Yeah, well, it's going to go after the last column, but what's it going to do? Yeah, no, it's going to give you nothing. Yeah, I'm just going to copy this and go back. Let's look at the date again. There's a date and a time. Is 7, 10 a.m. the same thing as... The, this, in this case, December 24th. 
It's not. When you use a timestamp, and you do something like this, it assumes that. You have to be careful when we work with date times or timestamps, depending on the database server, they're called date time or timestamp, because database servers are anal retentive. They assume whatever you told it is exactly what you want to find. And if it says, well, that doesn't match the data type I'm working with, we're going to finish filling it out for you. Therefore, it assumes, actually, let's be more precise. It actually, Postgres assumes that. And that should still give me zero rows, I think. Yes, because I, there is none like that. So people are saying, well, how do you find this? How do you find things on that date? There's two ways of handling it. And people are going to look at me and go, oh, God. Wait for it. Uh, it helps if you type in the word and. Whoop. Right? Now, let's read this as an English sentence. Select everything from customers where created on is greater than or equal to midnight, December 24th, and less than midnight, December 25th. Hey? No. It's a date. You can't ma pattern match on dates. You can, but it's not done like that. I will be showing you guys how to do that later when I start teaching you guys about functions. Because in all of computing, there's one kind of math that sucks the worst. You guys want to know what kind of math sucks the worst? Date math. It is the bane of every developer. Why? Because some parts of the world don't use AM, PM. Some parts of the world do use military time instead or whatever, you know, 24 hour clock. Some parts of the world put in their dates month, day, year. Then you have Americans, which is month, day, year. Or everybody else does year, month, day, or day, month, year. Biggest to smallest or smallest to biggest. Why? Because Americans are dumb. <laughs> Not quite, but they're stuck in their ways and they don't like changing. They just don't like changing. Like technically, Americans are metric. They introduced the metric system in the 60s. They don't use it. It's not as dumb as the as the British, which use three different measurement systems. But it's still pretty dumb. But at least the British dates are standard. Can points for that. I can work with British data any day. Um, but that's how you deal with dates. Is that? Um, there is actually there is one way to do it, and let's say you want to match. Whoops! See, that's going to look funny. Okay, there's something I can do, and. Let's say I want to match just for a specific year, which is a little challenging because you've got to match on an exact, right? And let's say you could do you know, greater than or equal January 1st. And I'll introduce you guys to the fact that there's something called functions in SQL. I'll do it today. I'm actually going to do it in more detail later, but because I'm dealing with dates, it's a good time to show you guys this one. And Postgres has a ton of dates. Uh, functions. For date time, Postgres has like 25 functions just to deal with dates because dates suck. Uh, it's got string functions where you can make strings uppercase, lowercase, split it, match it, you know, explode it, do whatever you want with it. Turn it into an array even if you want. However, it has a function called date part. I just got to check my syntax here.
Now, did you notice that kind of hiccuped? You actually saw a noticeable pause while I thought about it. It took 513 milliseconds. Now, the reason it took that, because it actually has to go through every date and explode the date into its component pieces and extract the year. Um, this is the really lazy way I want to find anybody December 2015. Now it took only 45 milliseconds. There's a reason for that. It's because it was actually able to do a quick table scan once before. Postgres is smart. It cached my previous results and it filtered that. MySQL won't. MySQL has some other way of doing this and it, it's painful. However, you, as you can see, you can target specific parts of the date. Is it the best way of doing it? No, unless you literally are aiming for blocks of date and time. Realistically, you'd, you're better off using and this one here is kind of tricky. Now, okay, will it, but yeah, but what happens, will, am I, am I going to include everything that happened on the 31st or not? No, because it assumes the end of the day, midnight, right? So it assumes this, which tells me even if it's this, it won't get included into the record. So how do you find that one? Because Postgres is anal retentive and it really cares about its dates. And I do this. And I got an error message. Uh, because I don't have my field. Oh, Dan. Bang. Here's everybody who got created in December. 416 records. Fantastic. Actually, I'm just going to pull up their uh, name, email, and created on just so that you have a smaller subset to see on the screen at once. There it is. See all the December ones. Now there's actually a faster way of writing this. That's the one. Because it assumes what are the odds that there's a, a record in your database created at that very microsecond? What well, it's if you're Amazon, it's possible. If you're anybody but Amazon and maybe Facebook or Twitter, the actual fact that Twitter and Amazon and Facebook don't track dates that precise either. They really don't care. They're happy with seconds of precision. Well, actually, I think, I think they go to half seconds, tenths of a second, because for them, that's enough precision. And I can do this. And once again, it'll give me everybody in December. And as you can see, it's very nice and quick. It's not too painful. And that's how you deal with dates. Because dates are terrible to work with. And those are your three ways of handling the dates. You can either do a greater than or less than. You can do a between or you can extract the date part. Yeah. No, because the first one assumes. If it assumes that. Yeah, exactly. And this one assumes the beginning of the day also, which is the odds of something going in at that very, you know, at that very moment is pretty small. Um, the mind you, I could actually set the data to be equal to that if I wanted to. But really, would I care? Um, so, so far I showed you guys the wildcard match. Showed you guys how to match on IDs and a range of IDs. I've shown you how to deal with dates and a range of dates and, how to, and, a, par, and a partial date. Um, believe it or not, that's 90% what you need for a where clause. It's a, it's a case of learning how to combine the ands and the ors. And that's what the labs are for. 
Now, there is, I did post a link on Blackboard. In the course documents, I'm just going to get to it. Write this one right here. PG exercises. PG exercises has um, some very good basic tutorials. So if you're having a hard time understanding what I covered today, and since I don't really give you guys that many hybrids, like that much homework, I don't give you guys reading assignments really. These are good because if you go basically from here to here, plus working with dates, that'll cover everything I did today. And the tutorials are pretty cool. Um, it gives you a small diagram, which kind of sucks, but it's there. It gives you what it should look like. It gives you what you've typed in. If you didn't get it, you can ask for a hint. And then when, if you get it. And when you hit run, it shows you your results. And it tells you if you got it right or not. And then at the bottom, it explains what you just did. So if you need more help, you can actually go for the answer and it'll show you what to do. Then you can run it here and experiment with it. It's a really good tutorial if you're having a hard time. That tiny little first hump with SQL. Normally that's where, if you can get past this first set of humps, you're usually pretty good. Well, until I throw more complicated stuff at you, but for the first couple of lab, for the first lab and a half, this is enough to get you through the first, the next lab. Um, like I said, that exercise and specific columns from a table. I showed you guys that already. Um, this one, how to do a where clause. So it shows you how to, how to expect what it should look like. So it's actually pretty good and it's got good hints and stuff. Uh, if you are trying to find more complex um, examples, the tutorials from SitePoint. This one has a lot more detail. So if you get past the PG exercises, do you feel like you need more meat? Go to the second set. It's not a tutorial in the sense where you can type in commands and run it, but it, they give you really complete examples and shows you what it should look like and the explanation of why it does what it does. Um, those are two fantastic uh, resources. And the good news is they're Postgres specific, so you they won't you won't get the problem that you sometimes have when you type in how to do this in SQL and you end up with syntax for a different database server. Even though you know they're supposed to be standardized, they're not because you know MySQL is special. Yes, they're on Blackboard. Under course documents, dude. Yeah. They're one of the first things that, if you type in PostgreSQL space SQL space tutorial, I think it brings you to one of these two, the very first link you hit. So this one's fantastic, it'll do the job. And um, that's it. Finish your, ooh. Finish your assignments, although I erased the announcement. By midnight tonight, if you want a chance to get your full marks. Um, the test is done and over with. There's no saving you now. Um, they've been graded. And those that are late, well, you got your penalty. Just putting it out there. Um, and I'll see you guys at the lab.